good morning to each of you. We will pick back up in Ezra this week and by closing out chapter six, where we left off two weeks ago. And just a, a short recap for us of where we've been so far. Um, we find the people of God, the Israelites, returning to Jerusalem from exile. And uh, they were in Babylonian captivity for over 50 years and forced to do hard labor at the hand of uh, the, the wicked Babylonians, the hands of their enemies. But then God, the ultimate ruler over all nations, what does he do? He rises, raises up Cyrus, king of Persia. He, Cyrus, king of Persia, defeats Babylon. And Cyrus, king of Persia, being the tolerant king that he is, allows the religious people to go back and reestablish their religious worship. And so by God's decree, Cyrus overtakes Babylon, and by Cyrus's decree, the Israelites return to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple so that they can worship God rightly according to the law of Moses. And we saw early on in chapter 3 that, that things took off at the beginning. Uh, in no time, the people of Israel had the foundation laid. But soon, opposition began to set in. The, for, first off, the elders within Israel were not impressed, if you remember, with the foundation. The stones were nothing like the ones before. They, they were nothing compared to the big stones of Solomon's temple. The people of the land had some hidden agendas offering to help to build, but something else was at play in their hearts. And, and, and eventually, the Israelites got courage and discouraged by the people of the land that they put down their tools and stopped building altogether. And as their lives go on, they grow more concerned with building their own houses than they do with the house of God. But then God sends them a couple prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, and he moves the heart of Darius, the second king of Persia, to make another decree, allowing them to finish their work on the temple without any opposition even providing the funds from the national treasury to complete the project. And so this, all those things bring us to our text today uh, in Ezra 6, beginning in verse 13. And for Israel, this has been a time of transition, a time of rebuilding, a time of renewal as they get back into routine and reestablish their worship a time of revival as their hearts are spurred anew towards serving the Lord is what the people of Israel are getting back to. That's the time they find themselves in. So let's, again, pick it up in Ezra 6, verse 13, and we will read through the end of the chapter. This is the word of the Lord. Then, according to the words sent by Darius the king, Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, Shethazar Bazanai, and their associates did with all diligence what Darius the king had ordered. And the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. They finished their building by decree of the God of Israel and by decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes king of Persia. And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And the people of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the returned exiles, celebrated the dedication of this house with, of God with joy. They offered at the dedication of this house of God a hundred bulls, two hundred rams, four hundred lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, twelve male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their divisions for the service of God at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. Verse 19. On the 14th day of the first month, the, the returned exiles kept the Passover. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves together. All of them were clean. So they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the returned exiles, for their fellow priests, and for themselves. It was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile 
and also by everyone who had joined them and separated himself from the uncleanness of the people of the land of the land to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful and had returned the heart and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them, so that he aided them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Now, uh, the first two verses, 13 and 14, give us a nice little summary of, of everything we just talked about, everything leading up to this point. Uh, according to the decree of Darius and the encouragement that God brought through Haggai and Zechariah, the workers carried on. They picked their tools back up and set off on their work of building the temple. And when we get to the end of verse 14, we notice this intriguing verse that says, They finished their building by decree of the God of Israel and by decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And this house was finished. And finally, after all of these years of rebuilding, the house of the Lord, the temple, is finished. Now, right off the bat, one thing you might notice in verse 14 is that you have the building being finished by the decree of God, which we would expect. God turns the hearts of individuals and and sets them off on the course to rebuild this temple. But you also see by the decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, by their decree as well. And you might be wondering, well, whose decree is it then? Whose decree allows them to finish? Because at one level, you have the temple construction in accord with the plans and decisions of human efforts, of human beings, the kings of Persia and the workers who built it. But from another vantage point, it was the decree of God. God decreed it and willed the workers at every step of the way. And again, we might ask the question, well, which is it? It, Can it be both? The decree of God, or is it the decree of of human beings? Well, I think my brief answer would be that indeed it is both God's decree and the decree of these kings, so to speak. Because from the beginning of this book of Ezra, We have seen how God has moved the hearts of individuals to accomplish his purposes. Yes, Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes might be kings of Persia, but God is their ultimate ruler. God is the ultimate king, not just of the land that they're ruling in, but of all lands, of all peoples, of all nations. But additionally, from the beginning of this book, we have also seen that God works in accord with the wills of human beings, in the actions that humans take. The whole desire for the people wanting to return to Jerusalem was so that they could get back to following the law rightly. And the whole reason that Cyrus initially decreed them to return was because of his religious tolerance. You know, not a lot of people liked the Babylonians. Babylonians made you bow down to their idols. You couldn't worship your gods. But then the Persians come along, Cyrus and the rest come along and say, you know, maybe if we want the people to like us, we should allow them to worship whomever they want to worship. And so by Cyrus's decree, the Israelites are allowed to return to Jerusalem under Cyrus's order of religious tolerance, reacting against a Babylonian culture. So God uses this purpose from Cyrus to bring his purposes to pass as well. And theologians and philosophers since the beginning of time have have tried to make sense of this tension between the will of God and the, the free agency of human beings, something we've probably all wrestled with within our own minds. Is it God acting or is it his people acting? Do we have free will or do we not have free will? Which is it? 
Yet as we read in Scripture, it's a, it's a bit more complex than just one or the other. We find that God is able to act in a way that does not violate the decision-making of human beings. But God is also able to accomplish His divine plans through people. It's a both and. Who decreed the temple to be built? Well, God did. And so did the kings of Persia. As the text says, it's both and. And this is important for us to take note of in a day and age like ours. Um, Because what is the ultimate ruler and authority and king really in our day? Well, it's scientific evidence. You hear this a lot. That is the only legitimate source of truth for most people in our day. Way to find fact. So when presented with the question, who decreed the temple to be built, the only answer for scientific fact would be the kings of Persia. You can't prove God. But I want to, again, make us a more nuanced people because just because something can be explained one way does not mean that there is no other logical explanation that can work in perfect harmony with that explanation. And so the reductionistic nature of our world today says that we are nothing but chemicals and atoms. Result of a cosmic explosion that set the world off on the path that we currently find ourselves in. And there's no point to life. We're just, you know a product of that. But you might ask most people on the street if they actually believe that, if they actually believe that their life has no purpose and they're just made up of atoms and chemicals and, and what have you. And most people will answer, no, I think I'm more than that. I think I'm more valuable than that. I think I have purpose. I'm more than a collection of cells. And for us, within the church, as we take up Scripture and look at the the plain revelation in God's creation around us, indeed, we find that there is much more to us than the atoms and the chemicals we are made up of. Because indeed, that's one reality. We are made up of those things. But there's more. We are also embodied souls created by a God who deeply cares for us and who is deeply involved in his creation of atoms and chemicals. Life is more than the materialism that this age teaches. It has value. It has meaning. It has purpose. We have worth. And here in Ezra 6, by the hands of these embodied souls, acting together with their human nature and under the decree of God and under the decree of the kings of Persia, they finish the temple, which we see in verses 16 to 18 of our text, for the purpose of worship. And what a time of celebration this would have been. Again, after all these years, this was their main drive in returning from Babylon to to finish, to to rebuild this temple. And finally, it's finished. 21 years it took them to finish the temple. And as I was reading our text, I couldn't help but find it a bit ironic that when we get to this point of temple completion, all we get is three verses. Three short verses about how the temple is finished. That's it. But this has been the entire purpose of the book so far. Is to get to this point of temple completion. Rebuilding the temple. It's what the people have been trying to do since the beginning. Again, 21 years to get to this point. And much more if you count all of the years they were in Babylonian exile. Desiring to get back to this point. And they finish it after their 21 years of building so that they could finally worship God according to the law of Moses. And it does say that they celebrated with joy in verse 16. 
But again, for me, at least, I thought after six and a half chapters, you might expect a little more pomp, a little more celebration. But this is all we get, these three verses. They return, the returned exiles finished their work, and they were happy. They offered some animals as a sacrifice, and the priest and the Levites finally had a job again. That's what our three verses tell us. Because if you remember, of those priests and Levites that returned, that long list that we read in chapter 2 with all those names that I practiced all week for, they didn't have a job up until this point. I mean, sure, they helped on the build, but as far as their status is concerned, as priests, as Levites... They couldn't worship, they couldn't offer sacrifices appropriately until this point in time. But that's it, those three verses. And additionally, I couldn't help but notice the number of animals that they offered. A hundred bulls, two hundred rams, and four hundred lambs. And for us, that sounds like quite a bit. Sounds like a lot of animals. But once again, if you go back in time and compare it to Solomon's temple, the first temple, this was nothing. Small potatoes. Solomon once offered a peace offering of 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So this number on this day when they finished the temple is quite small. And probably even more importantly, or sad, I guess, for this new temple, is that there's no Ark of the Covenant. There's no tablets of stone engraved with the Ten Commandments. There's no pot of manna. There's no Aaron's rod. None of these things which, have, which would have been in the first temple, in the Holy of Holies. And of course, there was no king in Israel anymore. There was no Solomon, there was no David, there was no no head figure leading the nation. There was no royal pageantry like there would have been in the temple prior when that one was finished. And so in every way, this temple paled in comparison to the one before it. Yet, despite the lean nature of all of this, the expectation of blessing was still present and was still on the minds of the people of God. They still had hope in what was to come. Zechariah preached times of blessing that were still future for them. The current environment might not reflect it to them, might not reflect their times of blessing, but if there is any lesson that God continues to remind his people of, It's this lesson of patience as we wait for the reward that lies ahead. In lean times, faith encourages us to look away from ourselves into the unfailing promises of God that he will provide, that he will bless his people, that he is with us, and that he will save us. And this is the unshakable hope that remains even with these returned exiles. Here at the dedication of their new temple. And this hope is why they desire to institute their right worship once again. The the proper worship in accordance with the law of Moses that God gave them because they know that God is faithful. That he is steadfast and that he is worthy of their worship, as he is the cause for their existence. He is the reason for them even getting to this point. And so the faith that Israel sustained for these last 80 years, since the beginning of their time in exile, is quite a testimony in and of itself. Through the exile, and now through all their opposition, they remained committed to reestablishing worship. Holy worship. Though times of helpful helpful rebuke came to set them off on the proper course again, in the end, finally, they did complete their work. 
And as a result of their labor, right worship of God was instituted according to the law of Moses. As the temple was reconstructed in Jerusalem, as sacrifices on the altar could continue once again. And sacrifices could be made to atone for their sin. And so the people of God are back. And they are able to obey what has been written in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the book of Moses. And further evidence of this is what follows next in our text. As we move into the Passover, which would have taken place a month after the completion of the temple. And it's probably the most important festival on the Hebrew calendar. For it marked the beginning of Israel's history as a nation, when God brought them out of Egypt, brought them out of bondage, into the wilderness and eventually into the promised land. And this would have been, this Passover would have been, the first time that they were able to celebrate this since the destruction of the temple from before under Nebuchadnezzar. Because sacrifices, again, were not permitted anywhere else besides Jerusalem. So for the entire exile, they were not able to celebrate Passover properly like they were able to now on, now that the temple is complete. And so a whole new generation is back in Jerusalem able to celebrate this Passover like they never would have before. And so for most of the nation, this, this was their first Passover. Um, if anybody, a few would have remained from before. They would have been in their late 70s and 80s. And so a few of them would have been around, but for the most part, this would have been Israel's first Passover together as a new nation out of the bondage of Babylon. And notice one of the sweetest things about this celebration in verse 21. It's also ironic that we get more verses about the Passover than we do the temple completion. But notice verse 21. First, we see the Israelites eating the Passover meal. But then we also see that there are people who joined them. People who separated themselves from the uncleanness of those of the land in order that they too might worship the one true holy God. These aren't Israelite people. These are people of the land. They aren't ethnic bloodline. They're Samaritans, mixed bloodlines, or even no connection in their blood not bloodline. These are Gentiles who have been welcomed in. And what a sweet thing that this is to see in Jerusalem surrounding the temple of God. And if you remember, back in chapter 4, we might have fallen under the suspicion that the people of Israel were narrow-minded and, and separatist. If you remember, they, they rejected the offer of the people of the land to help with the build. But then we quickly realized that their help was not as it seemed at first glance. The people of Israel here are serious about their faith. It's a whole lifestyle commitment to be a temple worshiper, to be a, a, a worshiper of the one true God of Israel. So even though they said no thanks before, because of other motives were at play, they still gladly invite them to the table if they have genuine faith if they believe in the one true God that is rescuer of his people, that, have, that has provided for his people, that has saved his people. So the same God that brought Israel out is that is able to redeem them, even the people of the land. And Israel recognized this about the Lord. And they knew that part of their reason for existing as a nation was that they could be lights to the nations around them. They were to spread the good news about who God was, that He is a Redeemer. 
that he is a rock you can lean on. And even in this time for Israel's history as a nation, after the the exile, as they're serious about their faith, as they recognize that they are lights to other nations around them, the other people around them, can't help but draw the parallels, right? How true this is of us. First, worship is not something that we just do on Sunday morning between the hours of 10 and 11 or 11.15 or 11.30 if Joe goes really long. Worship is more than what we do here. It's a lifestyle, like it was for these returning exiles. It includes every day of our week. It includes the the really important tasks that we do and down to the really mundane, everyday tasks that we do. Are we thanking God for the able bodies he has given us? Are we thanking him for the minds he allows us to think with? Are we praising him for the the beauty of his creation that surrounds us? Do we thank him for the people he has put in our lives whom we care about and whom care about us? Do we thank him for the jobs we have, the cars we drive, the homes we live in, and so on? These are all gifts from him, and with or without them, He is worthy of our praise. So too, our worship ought to be a lifestyle. But the second thing also, we we are a light. Just like Israel was to the other nations, we are a light to the people around us. It's not this building that's the light. It's not this building that's the light. It's it's each of us. It's you. It's, It's me. We are the light to the people around us. We are the people who reflect God's glory in a dark world. We are the beacons of hope that are able to shed light on some really dark situations as we offer the hope that exists within the Lord. The hope found in His Son, Jesus Christ. And so in spite of whatever it is people are going through, whatever it is they have done in their past, There is hope for them at the cross. There is life for them in Christ. There is salvation belonging to the Lord. There's hope for all people. I couldn't help but notice, you know, if I'm driving west on 340, uh, there's a a marquee sign that I I pass. And I, I think, I don't know what the store is now. It used to be a restaurant, then a Coleman store, and I don't know what it is now. But on the, the marquee, it reads, you know, pray for Linda Stolzhus and family. And then what does it say below that? And Justo. And you think, for the former family, you're like, yeah, I'm, I'll gladly pray for the Stolzhus family. What a tragic situation that all is. And how sad it is when you consider all that. And then I read Justo, and I was like, no! I don't want to pray for him. I'm, I was, you know, ang- I'm angry at him and what he's done. And I I know some of his family. But then you start to consider even a text like Ezra 6 and who who the Israelites were to the people surrounding them. And the fact that even Eusto, even for him, there is grace, there is mercy at the foot of the cross. There is hope even for him and people like him. There is hope for even people much worse than him that exists in our world. There's life for each of us in Christ. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Him. So yes, we can pray for Linda Stosfus and family and for Justo and his family as well. And that he too would come to know the life found in Christ alone. And additionally, as we're on this topic of of being light to the world around us, uh, at some point along the way, I think we lost this a bit, at least in our cultural context here in Lancaster County. And and sometimes I think we get complacent and we think that someone else will come along and and do, do the work of evangelism, of sharing the gospel with our neighbors or our friends or whomever. 
Uh, we, we'll leave it to the next guy, so to speak. Um, and I don't know if that's a cultural context thing, like I said, where it's because at one point in time, Lancaster County was very, very Christian. And so it was almost assumed that the person you run into, well, they were Christian. They, they knew the gospel. They went to Sunday school. They went to church every Sunday. And so I don't know if, if that's kind of what lost our, our, our lighthouse, so to speak, our light among the nations, our, our drive in that area. But even as we consider the gospel, whenever we find Christ in doing his miracles or, or being compassionate on the people, what else is he always doing? He's always teaching and sharing the good news with them. His miracles, his actions are never separated from his teaching. And so some, some, for me, at least, I find it intriguing, at least here in Lancaster County, our cultural context, where I think we're, we're quicker than normal to push that off on somebody else or just to assume that the person across from us is a Christian. When, as I at least look at the cultural context around us today, that's far from the truth. I mean, I engage with students on a weekly basis at at the factory who are all from this area that don't know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I wonder for us, too, as we consider of what it means to be a light to the nations around us, you know, it's not just about sending missionaries around the world, but it's also being missional right here in our own homes around us with our neighbors, with our coworkers, and so on. Do they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Do they know him as their hope? Can we share that truth with them? Or are we going to wait for somebody else to do it? If I want to love my neighbor, what does that really mean? I can provide for them resources, absolutely. I can help them with assistance, sure. But do they know about Jesus Christ, their one true hope for eternal life? And so I offer that for us this morning as well, is as we engage with the world around us, as we engage with our neighbors, our coworkers that might not know the Lord, are we quick to bring him up and mention of his mercy and his grace, even for the most wretched of sinners, people like me? Salvation doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the Lord. Are we willing to invite people to church? Are we willing to invite them into our homes for dinner? Or out for dinner? Maybe not today's world, out for dinner, but in for dinner. Are we a light to the people around us? And back in Ezra, for those who remained in the land, even those who had no ethnic affiliation with Israel, notice that they too were welcomed to participate in the Passover as they identified God as their Lord. The one true God of Israel became their God, separating themselves from the uncleanness from their former things and embracing this God of Israel. In view is this pattern of repentance and faith as they turn from their old nature and embrace the promises of God. Their profession of of faith would have looked similar to Ruth's, the Moabites. When she says, Where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, and anything but death part me from you. This is the Moabite woman's confession of faith. Your God, my God. I will leave my unclean Nature, my unclean ways, I will leave Moab and come into your land, professing the one true God of Israel. And so on this Passover day in Israel, back in in, in Ezra chapter 6, all of true Israel was present. Those born within the ethnic boundaries of Israel, but also those born outside the bloodlines who came in later, who professed belief in the same God. They are present. God's people consist of all those who have faith in him and who are prepared to submit themselves to him in true worship. 
In this Passover celebration that they're partaking in is a parallel for what we still do today with the Lord's Supper, communion. Which I hope to be able to do again with you all one day soon as we we figure out exactly how to do it, deliver all the things safely, COVID-free. But in communion, the same thing is true. All who have turned and repented from sin and those who hold fast to the promises of God are welcome to the table. Are welcome to take the bread and the celebration then was just a taste of what was to come with the celebration that exists at the Lord's table. What we celebrate is is not our coming out of Egypt from bondage, but being freed from the bondage of our own sin. Celebrating the victory that has brought us from death to life. For us, we are not saved by the blood of lambs or bulls or goats on our doorposts, but by the blood of Christ poured out on the cross. And just as the temple pointed forward to Christ, so does the Passover as the bread would become Christ's body and the wine would become His blood poured out for us, shed on a cross for His people, Christ's body broken for you. And the Savior would not give His people temporary victory over our enemies, but eternal victory a once-and-done action performed on the cross. By the grace of God, He has given us abundant life through the sacrifice of His own Son, our spotless and holy Lamb. So, oh, what a merciful God we serve that will offer and invite us to His table. Oh, what a joyful celebration this is Yes, it was a joyful celebration here in 516 B.C. back in Ezra 6 as they recognized God's provision for them in the land and through the rulers of all these nations as God and they decree. But oh, what a joy it is in in knowing that we are in Christ and will be with Him in glory forever. What a joyful feast it will be on the last day when we sit down with our brothers and sisters in faith, when we lounge next to our great cloud of witnesses as we all worship as one, our one true holy God at the marriage supper of the Lamb for eternity, which is what Revelation 19 talks about. That's our hope. That's our goal. That's our aim. That's why we hope in Christ. That's why we hope in His work finished on the cross. On the cross, not just for you, but for all those that are in Him. Not just those inside this wall, but all of true Israel that find themselves in Him. Believing and professing and desiring to worship Him with pure hearts. And in times when we fail and fall short, there's still hope for us. The table is still open. It's not restrictive. It's inviting. Oh, what a God we serve. Salvation belongs to the Lord and to Him alone. And let us praise God for that. Let's pray. God, we thank You that You are our rescuer, that You are our provider, that You go before us and and you, You... you fight for us as you defeat our sin. You, you defeat death and, and you give us life as a result. God, I pray that you would cultivate in us hearts for worship, desires to serve you in all that we do, desires to worship beyond this place and in every part of our lives. God, I pray that we would be loving to our neighbors as well that yes, we would help them with their physical needs, their practical needs, but we would also help them and desire to help them with their eternal needs if they don't know you. Pray that we would bring up the hope that we have in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in conversation. 
I pray that we would be quick to invite those who might not know you to church or into our homes to share a meal with. I pray that we would be unashamed of your gospel, unashamed of your truth, unashamed to share the reality of what you have done for us to the people around us. And God, we thank you that it is not our fellow human beings that we try to please. We are not worried about what they think of us. But God, we know that all that we do ought to be for you and you alone. So I pray that you would cultivate our hearts in that way as well. And God, we thank you for your cross on which your son died for us, not in vain, but for us, for our sin, for our guilt, for our shame, so that we might have life, abundant life, with you and you alone forever. So we thank you for this gift, free gift of grace extended to us by your kindness. It's in his name we pray, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.